most of you know that I am Judith Cordo, and um, all this has been an amazing journey. You may wonder about this dress. Why would I mention this dress? Because this has been created by another artist, a fabric artist called Trish Cooper. You can look at this work the same as you can mine, and you'll be able to read some sort of a story from her creation. <coughs> so we all can create. We're meant to create. Mr. Stefania, this Italian curator, contacted me, and um, I thought it was a joke. It was no joke. When we made contact, I said to her, well, what do you want? And, and she wanted work that I did 30 years ago. And I said, but, you know, they're, they're all gone. It's one of the Christchurch hospitals. You know, people walked in the North Island, South Island. Well, she said, do some more. And she said, I know they'll be beautiful. So that was her requirement, beautiful artworks, because the world is in such a turmoil, and, and she just wanted to talk about positivity. And she looks all around the world for people that will tell the world what she would like to say, but she can't. She finds all of us, and then, then she'll make an exhibition in New York, and then from there, we to Milan, uh, my work, representing New Zealand. And you probably can pick up from my accent that I'm not a New Zealander, or New Zealander, but I've been here over 50 years. That's a long time. That's half a century. I'm a New Zealand artist. I'm going to represent New Zealand. I feel very proud to be a New Zealand because what I've learned all around here has arrived because of this wonderful country. We're free to say what we want to say. I'm married a Hungarian. Now that was another interesting exercise. He escaped, he was a political prisoner, and uh, he'd been locked up because he was political. He was a so-called aristocrat. Uh, but because he didn't have freedom uh, until they opened the prisons and let them all go, and he ended up in New Zealand. He couldn't go back because of the political thing, and, uh, but he couldn't settle in New Zealand. So my life, very exciting. I was allowed to play my music um, and have several children, four children to this Hungarian, um, and, but we were off around the world. And one minute I'd be attending with the Arabs and the next minute I'd be in Venice. Then we were in Spain and they were doing the dancing in Spain. So my life was filled with an amazing array of stuff. Um, so I have to thank him for that. But back on to where I began. There were no paintings on my walls in the houses that I lived in when I was young, up to about 16. The first artwork on the wall was the one I bought when I was young. It was a ballet dance. My father, when I asked him a question, he would just say, in a sturdy voice, work it out yourself. And that's what I had to do. He wouldn't give me any answers. There were no books in my house. Because books are dangerous things because I could go blind. And anyway, they're only stories. So here am I, living in this void. And they didn't like music. So I used to get in the back veranda and have my ear to the material to hear the music. And uh, but what changed me was when I was about 10, I went to a film about Mother Fontaine. Oh my God, there's another world out there. It's, that's the world I want to be on. The freedom, the dancing, the artistry. It was just, just mind-boggling to me. It might have been a secret film I've been to. I did not go to Don't get it all wrong. My mother really loved me. All she wanted in life was a daughter named Judy. Anyway, this dear uncle of mine came up from Sydney, a hundred miles from where I lived. I lived in a coal mining area, a hundred miles from Sydney. It was cold and miserable. Uh, very difficult, actually, quite a challenge. But anyway, he brought this violin up and uh, we used to do duets together because he'd learned the violin a little bit. And then he said to my father, well, well Arthur, you'll have to get another teacher for this, this, this girl. Anyway, so he found a teacher, 
who'd had six months' lessons ahead of me at a convent, but now to get the money for the lessons. He said, right, you could have Friday lessons, but you have to be with her. You have to be with her. So I had the whole lot of garden, the vegetable garden, that he didn't want to do, and so he taught me how to do it, that was good. A bit of string here, a stick, you know, and so I had to put the seeds in. And as, as well as that, I had to push this lawn up and keep the lawns. Four shillings a week, and I went to see this teacher, but after a while, Aunt said, look after, you know, you have to find a better teacher. So we found another teacher in, 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 in uh, Lithgow, but he had a heart attack after that. And so then there was another problem, another teacher. It was, I mean, you know, it's a small place. There's not going to be a lot of learned people there to teach people like me. Um, and so they found a piano teacher. She couldn't really play the violin, so I had to work it out myself, didn't I? Um, but I did come first to Miss Stephen and tell me, but there wasn't that much competition. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, I do. But anyway, this uh, other attitude that my family seemed to have, and a lot of people do have this back then, it's a long way away from today, um, was that anybody who was an artist or a musician or any creative person had to be very beautiful. They were up to no good. And, uh, goodness me, and uh, so me wanting to find the answers. Um, but anyway, um, then at school we had this marvellous art teacher, and I can still remember his name. Mr. Dixon. One of the first things he taught me was using this as a teaching aid. Renoir's painting of the two girls at a piano. And he said, look, he said, look how this Renoir has got this green colour and he's moved the colour all around the painting. And so my paintings, the colour moves all around and that was from the seed of this teacher, this marvellous man who taught me only the basics. He taught me the craft of art. Not a lot. Line, texture, colour, all of this basic stuff. And so that lit the flame. Probably one of the reasons too why these works have developed because I've been free to do them. They weren't planned. They weren't breathed out. They just happened like this little boy did this. You can see he's really tried to do a careful drawing, you know, you can just see it. Just, you know. And then he got so jolly frustrated, he just went, Aah! But that's okay. Nobody said to him, hey, this is how you do it. Not like me, when I was at school, the teacher said, oh, we're going to draw rain today. So I did rain. Right? Fill the page with little dots of rain. The teacher came along and said, you don't do rain like that. Where's the umbrella? I said, I couldn't get my head around this. This is what I did, just like this little boy. And, uh, and I, when I walked to school, I didn't have an umbrella. My world walking to school was with a raincoat and the rain coming in front of me. This artist, Barry Cleveland, most of you know him, he was one of the tutors in, in the university in Christchurch when I was there. This was in, uh, on the net, and he had this drawing of some sort of a, a clown doll or Japanese doll, I don't know what it was. But this doll was sitting at his table, and he decided to draw. There's his drawing of it. But the difference with this, from this to this, is that Barry learned the craft. He learned how to do it. He wasn't shown how to do it. He was only shown the notes, like a composition. If you're a composer, which I haven't got that ability, you've got eight, no, seven notes actually. A, A sharp, B, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, and you start reading. There are variations of those notes. There's A sharp. A, A sharp, B, C, C sharp, you can add on but the basic notes are seven. So, my little motives are built up, all these words are built up like a composer writes a composition on those basic notes. Mine are basic shaped. I'm not going to tell you what they mean. That's for you to stand and look at my words. 
you want to make instant gratification from my arm, you have to look at my You have to study it and work it out yourself. Like my father said. See, he did quite a lot of good for me. Work it out yourself. Find the answer yourself. Say what you want to say. Because in New York, I learned that these artists there could say what they want to say. I saw a, a, a metal rose. There is the rose but at the top, two stories high. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if the sculptor could make me a rose as tall as the two stories high? I thought that talked about love. How grand is that? And in New York, they just do whatever they want. If they want to sneak a plant on a painting, there they were. I mean, I've never seen such unusual stuff. Also, I actually saw the sparkles on paintings. And so I came home, and because they talk about women, that's what started all this off, um, when you get older, um, you've lost the, the bloom of life, like the blossom trees. Uh, and us ladies, we buy clothes with labels. We buy total clothes. We might buy a bit of sparkle, like I did. And uh, the labels are interesting. You can have a closer look at those. I think this one's got a, a new zoo. Yes, it's got a kiwi. I thought that was a good one. These are all found at Mark Tavis. Dirty old, worn out bags. And, uh, so I finally got the dry clean, five at a time the dry clean set. Oh, that was great, they helped me. They're the canvas maker, put the bits on the back. So I got to work on making all these old bags beautiful, with colour and sparkle. And they all got their stitches. But it's like what's happened with the earthquake. It's no different. Thousands of earthquake shapes. I didn't even from one minute to the next. I knew where I'd, I'd run if, 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 if it started falling down the road. And the second uh, earthquake in Christchurch, that is in fact what happened. And it's a horrible thing because you worked all your life to get to that plateau. Nobody left me any money, nobody did anything. Work it out yourself. So I worked out a way. And uh, don't talk to me about, oh, you haven't got time to do art. I'll show you a picture of me with my fifth child. And, uh, Here I am, in a little cottage, <coughs> and you see I'm painting. My daughter was in bed, here's her teddy bear, milk bottle of the lot. I had to paint. See this? All amongst all the... I didn't need a studio. A veranda's room. So I think it's a new studio. I've got a studio now, it's great. But I didn't need it. That wasn't promoted. Although they get to the art school. Do you need a studio? Will you forget? Make more money than me. <laughs> <laughs> but also, as I pass this photo around, you'll notice a picture of my wrinkle belly when I had five children. Um, my husband didn't like it. I tell you. The Hungarian. Um, and maybe it was his aristocratic blood or something. I don't know what his mind was thinking of, but anyway, I thought it was beautiful. It was soft. And so I did works based on the lines of the wrinkle belly. And that's another strange thing. That's one thing my father did teach me. He taught me how to knit in, under, over, off. And he said, sit in that corner, and if you took one stitch, you pull it under and start again. He was a tough, tough man. Anyway, the joke of it all is that these wrinkle bellies were created by dropping stitches. And you drop a stitch and these marvellous wrinkles. And I'll show you the first one that I created in this way. And uh, they were called wrinkle bellies. This is what happens with me. If I get a bit anxious about something or annoyed with making the work, I will then go off and do all these artworks until I get it out of my system. I recently seen a woman who has a favourite tree. 
and somebody doesn't like that she's got this baby tree, so they started digging it up. And she's so upset, she's tied this through to the fence. That might start me off on something else. But this is the little belly seat, and these hung, uh, where they're about 16 or 17, they hung in the CSA. But here we have this marvellous little girl, all due to dropping stitches and that somebody didn't like the little girls. And it's hung in your head. You feel it, it's soft. And anybody who's their babies in your hand, you'll know that feeling of soft. I'm not in this person. No, you're here, why I said. You were involved. I'm pleased with that. But see, and so, and, 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 and look, it's such a simple process. Look, art doesn't have to be so academic, or you don't have to be an expert at drawing. Everybody is different. You've only got to look at people's writing to know how different we are with our line work. You know, we can draw. We might not draw the same as Picasso or whoever, but we can still make a mark like, like this little boy. Another interesting thing that happened too was in the schoolroom when I was a little kid, I don't know whether any of you people remember, but they used to put these coloured paper freezers of flowers and tulips along the bottom of the window. They did in Australia, I don't know about here. But those coloured paper ideas came back to me when I was writing a children's book about, I wasn't writing it, somebody else was a writer, but I was doing the pictures. And so this is myself and my daughter, because uh, it's still this, you know, it's, it's amazing what comes back to you, even at that time, coloured paper on a window. You know, we're very, it's, it's, it's creative, it's fantastic, really. You know, it's just coloured paper. But here was the other artist who used But when I went to New York, to MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, we had a room filled with these, just cut out paper. You know, you, you'd have to find a voice. It doesn't mean to say it's got to be an intellectual voice. If you want to take on the challenge of intellectualism, you can, you can do all this stuff. Copy a photograph, copy what's out there, but that's not your voice. You've got to create something you need to create. It's unique to you. I'm here. You've got ten, so that's quite good. Uh, but not only that, he's this marvellous artist. You all probably know who I had to write an essay about Frances Hoskins. When I, well, I chose to write about her because she found her voice in her life too. Her work was quite individual. Here's the other little coat. The earlier work, of course, you know, it was uh, early work. Was beautiful work. Still her work. But that became, that was a type of art. They wouldn't hang it when she did this work. Because that was her voice. But she was an old lady. Here she is painting as an old lady. They paint because they have to paint. That's their voice. They're not on drugs. They're not, you know, I've never even smoked a cigarette. And, you know, I create this way out stuff. I mean, is it the background? Is it the experience I had? Is it, is it a, a, a genetic throwback to York where my family were doctors and medics? I don't know. My family didn't know neither. My brother and sister were so different. In fact, they even called the doctor to me one day because I wanted to go to the music. The doctor said, she's all right, you get up the pole. <laughs> so I was allowed to go and study music. I love Tosco's work, but at art school, I don't know what was wrong with it, but uh, we were told that this man painted mud, and, but they didn't, they didn't know what he was seeing. He lived in the hills, and he saw that the hills weren't always brightly coloured, they were brown. You've only got to go to Fairley to see the brown hills. I mean, what was wrong with them? They hadn't looked. And here's this marvellous man. For two years, I had a model 
on Wayne's Dagging Games. What was he like? That was what I wanted to draw. But it wasn't at all easy. It didn't come right at the first go. This drawing, for instance, may be charming, perhaps even a little sentimental. But to me, it doesn't look like that. Now, now, every week, this little boy would turn up, and from the story, he paid him a bit of pocket money. And it doesn't look like it's that about. And so we carried on, week after week, all these drawings of this little boy to try and say what this little boy was like. He could have got the camera and said, right, done. <laughs> but it wouldn't be talking about what was in here, which is the most important thing. Well, pages on it. And I, I guess it would have done a lot more. But that's what they artists do. They, 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 they try and put down what they see. I was looking at a woman the other day. Oh, I said, I, I'm looking at your face. Oh, I mean, I, I, I said, I, 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 you know, if in 10 minutes I could draw it for you, you know, what I've seen. But people are quite anxious about this, this, this idea of us looking at them. I, I, I'm not sure where they're coming from because we've learned the craft. When we go to the doctors, They've learned what they know. And what are they looking for? Something wrong. But artists are looking for a line, a shadow, a suggestion about the, the hair or whatever. Now, we've got a artist, artist here in, in Timaru, John Kelman. And one day he said to me, Judith, I'd like to come to your house. He's a little bent up man now. Can't stand straight. His eyesight's failing but he wanted to come and draw my friend and I playing this. It was a real experience. I set him all up, yes, he wanted some water, a ice cream container of water. And he sat there for three quarters of an hour because that's how long we sat over here and played music. It's amazing. He's even put the little fuzzy bits of me here. He's even put in the music that he heard. Um, he's a real artist. Just brilliant, absolute, and that's what we should aim to be. Put down the truth. So, as you walk around these things, no instant gratification, no good going down to KFC and getting a quick meal or anything like that. You've got to look at them, and somebody has said, Judith, you know, I've, I've looked at this work for some weeks, and she said, I still find something. Um, and it's very difficult to put down what's in here. Um, I've got a professor friend who studies liver cells and uh, he's able to get the liver and cut it into slices and photograph them. And the amazing thing I found about it, uh, he shared them with me. That's just like what's in here is out there. These liver cells look like hills and mountains and valleys. I mean, I've got a, a good imagination too, don't get me wrong. But, but what do we do about how, how do we find what's in here? And I mean, the, the first painting that was sold was the uh, that black and white one with the cross. And it's got all right down the end, Earthquake, Earthquake City. No, Broken City. I've done so many, sorry. Broken City. And that was my response. And there, the crosses of the cathedral. And, oh, I'm so happy when the news came that they were going to rebuild their church. That's not to do with religion, but that, in my opinion, was the heart of Christ Church. It was there, the bells rang, we belong, you know, and you could walk in there. It had a certain smell, you know, it just, just was there, you could sit there. I hope I've given you all something to think about. That's what I'm I really love talking to you and I'm very grateful that you've all listened. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, just on behalf of the gallery, I just want to thank Judith for sharing her memories, her inspirations. I think it's very generous of you to spend your time with sharing with us. Um, and also thank you for your inspiration, your energy, your passion for art. I think it's very contagious and I think it does inspire us all.